As you remain standing, I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles with me this morning to the book of James. We're going to James chapter 5. We're going to begin at verse number 13. James chapter 5, beginning with verse number 13. James says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Here it is. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. I'd like to share with you for a few moments a very simple message entitled, The Dynamic Power of Prayer. How many of you believe that there is dynamic power in prayer in Jesus' mighty name? Father, would you glorify your name in this house? And may we leave here this morning confident that no matter what we face, You have supplied all the power that we need to get through it. And we believe this today in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen and amen. Give the Lord praise in his house one more time here this morning. And before you're seated, turn to your neighbor and tell him that you love him in Jesus' name. Now, many of you know that over the last several weeks, we have been talking about prayer, specifically praying with confidence. And I believe with all of my heart that when we pray, that the Father wants us to pray with confidence, confidence in Him. He wants us to be confident that He is God and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. We serve a good Father, and He delights not only in hearing our prayers, but also in answering our prayers. And He has promised us that when we come to Him, with a pure heart and in a right spirit, asking according to his will that not only will he hear our prayers, but he will answer our prayers. How many of you are thankful that we serve a God who answers prayer in Jesus' name? And he wants us to be confident of that. But last week we learned that God also wants us to be confident that Even when it seems that our prayers are not working, that God is still at work. God wants you and me to be confident that even when it appears that our prayers are not working, and there will be times when it feels that way, that we are confident that God is still at work in our lives. You know, I was thinking about it over the weekend, that when Josh or Amanda would come to me and they would make a request or they would ask me for something that I didn't always answer them immediately. There were times when I needed to pray about that myself. There were times when I needed Kathy's input and her counsel. There were times when I just needed to weigh it out in my own heart and consider the request that was before me. And so there was a delay. And my point is simply this, that in that time of delay, it would have been very easy for Josh and Amanda to think that I had forgotten about them or to think that their request wasn't that important to me. But they were confident that dad was up to something even when it appeared that nothing was happening, that there were things going on behind the scenes. And you know, I got to tell you that sometimes we need to be aware of that even as the children of God, that just because we don't see anything happening when we pray doesn't mean that he's forgotten us. It doesn't mean that it isn't important to him because God is concerned about 
about our hearts, and he's concerned about our lives. It doesn't mean that we've sinned. It doesn't mean that God has given even with us. It doesn't mean that God has forsaken us in any way, but it means that God is working behind the scenes, that even when I don't see it, that God is working all things together for my good because I love him and because I'm called according to his purposes. Can you say amen? God is still at work. God wants us to keep praying, to keep believing, and be confident that even when it doesn't seem like it, God is at work in our hearts and our lives. He wants us to be confident enough in him that we can just simply rest in his presence knowing that soon, that very shortly, God is going to move and the one who is promised is also able to perform in Jesus' name. How many of you know we serve a good father and he's never given up on us in Jesus' mighty name? But you know this morning there is something else that the Father wants us to be confident about in prayer, and that is he wants us to be confident that prayer makes tremendous power available to us. Let me say that. Every time we go into prayer, God wants us to be confident that prayer makes tremendous power available to us. James says to all believers in this powerful letter, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Another translation says it this way, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. James tells us in no uncertain terms that when earnest, heartfelt, continued, and persistent prayer is offered to the Father, that it makes tremendous power, power that is dynamic in its working, available to us. Now, did you catch that this morning? Because it doesn't sound like you did. He is telling us that when we pray, prayer doesn't just make power available to us, but rather it makes power that is dynamic in its working available to us. Prayer makes the power of God that works dynamically in our lives, in our circumstances, and in the challenges of life available to us. In other words, God doesn't want to just show up in your life. He wants to show up dynamically. He wants to show up dramatically in your life. How many of you believe that God can do more than you could ever ask or think in Jesus' name? You know, there are some men and women that they always want to show up late in a crowd. They always want to be the last ones in because they want you to notice that they have arrived because they're thinking that there's something. Lean into your neighbor and tell them, you're not anything really. I mean, just, just tell them that. But there's some people that they always want to arrive late because they want everyone to see that dramatic entrance. Well, let me tell you something, that that's why sometimes it feels like God is late, but he's never late. He's always on time. But he wants to show up when you have given up on yourself. He wants to show up when you've given up on all the other resources because he wants to show up in a dramatic way to remove all doubt that it was God who made a way where there seemed to be no other way. He wants you to come to the end of yourself so that your trust moving forward will never be on yourself but will always be on God. He wants to move dramatically in your life. He wants to move dynamically in your life and if you believe that, give him a shout of praise in this house here this morning in Jesus' name. This weekend, I was thinking about Hannah. And many of you know that Hannah was one of two wives that belonged to a man named Elkanah. <laughs> And even though he loved her very much, she was barren. It was physically impossible for her to conceive any children. And she was deeply ashamed of that condition because many of you know that tragically in that day, if you could not bear a child or conceive, it was seen as a curse from Almighty God. And so she was ashamed of her condition. But she was also shamed by Elkanah's other wife who provoked her years 
year after year and made her life miserable. But Hannah knew her God, and she knew that prayer makes tremendous power, dynamic in its working, available to us. And so Hannah prayed, and she sought the Lord and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And don't you know that when she returned home, that Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, because I have asked for him from the Lord. I want you to know that that happened because she was convinced that prayer makes tremendous power, dynamic in its working, available to us. And I just feel compelled here to say this this morning, that if you are a married couple here today and you have had a hard time conceiving, don't give up. And long before you spend thousands upon thousands of dollars for medical intervention, would you know today that there is a God in heaven that has promised that prayer makes tremendous power, dynamic in all of its working, available to us. And I still believe in 2020, surrounded by medicine and science, that my God can do anything and that nothing is impossible for him. In Jesus' name, can somebody give God the praise? You know, I was thinking about Peter. Peter, who was imprisoned for his faith in Jesus Christ and was actually scheduled for execution. But the church in that day knew that when we pray, it makes tremendous power, dynamic in its working, available to us. And the Bible says that constant prayer was offered to God for Peter by the church. And while they prayed one evening, the Bible says, Behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. I wish I had an hour to preach on that right there. How many of you are thankful that light still shines in the prison in Jesus? Jesus' mighty name. And he struck Peter on the side and he raised him up saying, arise quickly. And his chains fell off of his hands. Why? Because prayer makes tremendous power, dynamic in its working, available to us. And I don't know what you feel chained to today. I don't know what prison you currently find yourself in, but I want you to know that prayer makes tremendous power, dynamic in its working, available to you today in Jesus' Jesus name and he still sets the captive free can I hear a good amen if you believe that you know I was thinking about Elisha this weekend and his assistant Gehazi they were lodged in the city of Dotham one evening and the Bible tells us that while they slept the entire Syrian army surrounded Dothan because they wanted to kill this prophet of God and early the next morning Gehazi got up and he went outside with his cup of coffee and much to his amazement they are surrounded by the Syrian army and he goes back and he says alas my master what shall we do but you see Elisha wasn't afraid because he knew that prayer makes tremendous power that is dynamic in its working available to us. And so he answered and said, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and he said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. I don't know about you, but there are times when life gets so hard, all I can see is being surrounded by my enemy. But every once in a while, the Lord opens my eyes to make me know that there are more for me than that are against me in Jesus' name. And there's some of you that may feel surrounded, but you're surrounded by God. And he brought you here today to show you that there are more for you than that are against you. If God is for you, no one can be against you. In Jesus' name, come on, give God the praise if you believe that. When we pray, God makes tremendous power, dynamic in its working, available to us in Jesus' mighty name. So what power is made available to us when we pray? 
I don't know if you caught it while we were reading it, but James actually speaks of four areas in life that prayer provides power for. And I'd like to run right through them with you very quickly. First of all, prayer makes power to endure suffering. Prayer actually brings power to endure suffering. James 5 and verse 13, he says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Now, it's very important to point out the kind of suffering that James is talking about here. He is talking about enduring suffering. Say those two words, enduring suffering. He's not telling us that prayer will immediately take suffering away but that prayer will make power, tremendous power, available to us to endure seasons of suffering. Now, the suffering that he's talking about here is not primarily physical suffering, even though I believe it's almost implied in it. Rather, his focus is upon emotional and mental suffering that we experience in life. Those difficult seasons in our life when there are hurts and afflictions within our mind and within our emotions. And how many of you know what I'm talking about today? That we're passing through hardship and there are mental and emotional afflictions and anguish and fear that we experience in our life. And what he's talking about here is that when we pray, God gives us power to endure that mental and emotional suffering. You know, it's interesting, that word suffering there is only used four times in the entire New Testament. Now, there are other Greek words that are used throughout the New Testament, but this particular one is only used four times in the New Testament. This is one occasion here in James. The other three are all in one letter. The last letter that the Apostle Paul wrote before his martyrdom, and that, of course, was the letter we know as 2 Timothy. And if there was anyone who knew anything about enduring suffering, it was certainly the Apostle Paul. And in this final letter, before his execution, he encourages Timothy to do the same. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 3, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Later in verse 9 he says, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. And then finally in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5 he says, but you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. You know, sometimes we all go through hardships as families, as As married couples, we go through hardships at our place of employment or even at school or at the college that we go through within friendships and various relationships that we have. But we have to endure these hardships as good soldiers knowing that we are in a spiritual war and there is no getting out of it. Certainly there are going to be moments when your mind and your emotions are a wreck and a mess as the enemy enemy assails you, but we've got to be watchful for those enemy attacks. We have to endure the fiery darts of the wicked one, of unbelief and of sin, and we have to do the work with which we've been called to do and fulfill it in Jesus' name. But that's going to take more than willpower. You've got to have power from on high because you can't will yourself out of depression. You can't will yourself out of anxiety and fear. But I want you to know that prayer makes tremendous power, dynamic in its working, available to us. And he may not bring you out of it immediately, but he will give you the power day by day to endure until the storm is over in Jesus' name. And I know that there are many of you that came here today and you're under an attack. And emotionally and mentally, you are on your last nerve. But God brought you in here today to tell you that I've got all the power that you need to bring you through it and to know that I'm for you. And if I'm for you, no one can be against you. Greater am I in you than the one that is in this world in Jesus' name. He's got all the power we need. Give him all the praise here this morning in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. But there is also power to sing. 
power to sing. Did you see this? James 5 and verse 13. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Now, I find that very fascinating, that he turns from misery to cheerfulness. He starts out addressing the issue of misery, but now he turns to cheerfulness. And I think it's James' way of saying, it doesn't matter what season you find yourself in, never forget that God is your source. That God is the one you need to be leaning upon. Everyone goes to the Lord when they're miserable. But can you go to the Lord when all is well in life? Everyone goes to the Lord when their life is falling apart. I want to know, do you still go after him when everything is going well in your heart and your life? You can never take a break. In every season, God is your source. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, God is your source. I need to pray in the good times, and I need to pray in the bad times. I need to pray when all is well, and I need to pray when it feels like all hell is coming against me. God is my my source. And only prayer can turn a song into praise. Only prayer can turn a song into worship. There are many of you that when you come in here on Sunday morning, it is just a song service to you because you haven't spent any time with the Lord all week long. And you came in and you just sang songs here today. But for the rest of us, we've been praying all week long because we know that without Him, we're never going to make it. We were crying out, God, just see me through. And when we came in here today, we didn't come to sing a song. We came to worship the God. God who made a way for us this week in Jesus' mighty name. That's why praise and worship sometimes is so dry. It's because you have not been spending time with God all week long. My friend, I came in here excited because I've seen God make a way for me all this week in Jesus' name. How many of you are here to worship our God this morning in Jesus' mighty name? Bless God. Now, now listen, we got to be clear on this. Prayer can't make you a better singer. <laughs> that would really be a miracle for some of you. But I will tell you that prayer will give you the power to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Prayer will make your praise powerful. You know, sometimes we fail to recognize the deep connection between prayer and praise. And yet some of the greatest prayers in the Bible were actually songs of praise to the Lord. Your book of Psalms is nothing but a collection of prayer, of songs that are offered to God as prayer unto Him. God can power up your praise and make dynamic power available. That when you praise, I don't know if this just went and changed, but you got to make an adjustment. I don't like to do this, but something just happened in my mic. But there is something about when we pray that will bring dynamic power to our praise times in Jesus' name. My mind immediately went to the Apostle Paul and Silas when they were beaten to with in an inch of their lives and thrown into an old Philippian jail cell. They were chained there hand and foot. They were bleeding, beaten, bruised, and battered. And how easy it would have been for them to collapse under the pain and to give in to what could have been feeling like God had failed them. But you see, Paul and Silas knew that prayer makes tremendous power, dynamic in its working, available to them. And so at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and they were singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them when suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loose by the power of Almighty God. Can I stand and tell you that in 2020 prayer can empower your praise in the midnight hour and set you free in Jesus' mighty name. Don't don't let the enemy take your song. Don't let him steal your worship. You keep praising him through it all. God will make a way in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody give God the praise if you believe that. But prayer will also make power to heal the sick available to us. Power to heal the sick. He says, is anyone among you sick? 
Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and raise him up. I'm not going to take a long time here, but I am going to tell you that I still believe Jesus heals the sick. How many of you believe that with me today? Three of you. How many of you believe that Jesus still heals the sick? I am so thankful that Jesus is Jehovah Rapha. He is the Lord that healeth thee. I am so thankful that he has sent his word and he has healed all of our diseases. I am so thankful that he forgives us of all of our iniquities and he heals us of all of our diseases. I am so thankful that 2,000 years ago Jesus bore our pains and he carried our sicknesses. He is still a healer in Jesus' name. And I know that some of us are afraid of that. And my fear today is that we have no confidence in praying for the sick because we're afraid of what will happen if they don't get healed. Well, let me ask you this. What would happen if they did get healed? Instead of focusing on the negative, why don't we focus on the positive? Rather than saying what happens if they don't get healed, why don't we just start asking what would happen if they did get healed for the glory and the honor of God? I learned a long time ago that I'm not a healer. I couldn't heal a housefly of a headache. I am not a healer. Only God is a healer. I was only asked to pray the prayer of faith and then leave the outcome in the hands of the healer Jesus Christ. Christ, but I would much rather lay my hands on an individual with confidence that God can heal them than to not, than to not pray for them at all because of fear that they might not get healed. That is God's business. It's not mine. But we need to believe in this hour that God is still a healer in Jesus' name. And it has become quite painfully apparent to me that there are many Christians, they have more confidence in COVID hindering them than they do in Christ healing them. I don't want you to be afraid of a virus. I want you to be confident in the victor, Jesus Christ. He rose from the dead. He's victorious over death, hell, and the grave in Jesus' name. And there is still power to heal the sick in Jesus' name name. You know, I, I know that a lot of us are afraid of health care in the United States of America, and that is motivating your decision in the election booth. But can I tell you today, I've got a cheaper and more effective health plan this morning. It is prayer that makes tremendous power, dynamic in its, in its working in my life. I'd rather pray and believe that God can make a way where there seems to be no other way. Can I hear a good amen if you believe that our God is still a healer of our infirmities in Jesus' name? And then finally, there is power to be free from sin. There is power to be free from sin. Verses 15 through 16, he says, And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. I'm going to stand here today and tell you it is one thing for prayer to produce the power so that I might endure suffering. It is one thing to pray and for God to give me the power to sing and worship my God in the good times. It is one thing for me to pray and believe that there is going to be power even to heal my body. But I will tell you right now that the absolute greatest display of God's power is freedom from sin. That, that is the greatest display of God's power. Jesus made it very clear when he was actually challenged about his healing power. He says, which is actually harder, to pray for a man to be healed or to forgive a man of his sin? I want you to know that God's greatest display of power is that he has set us free from sin and now we are hungry for righteousness in Jesus' name. 
when we confess sin to one another and pray for one another, tremendous power, dynamic in its working, is available to set the captive free. And I want you here to hear me this morning that you don't have to be a slave to sin any longer. You don't have to live in sin's bondage one day, one hour longer. Prayer makes tremendous power dynamic in its working available and he can set you free not tomorrow not next Tuesday not next week he can set you free right now in Jesus mighty name can God can you give God the praise here in this morning but did you notice that there is one condition for receiving this tremendous power that we do have to touch on I built you all up to bring you back to this point. There is one condition that is laid out here. It's right there in verse 16. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Power isn't made available to just any prayer that is offered. It's prayer that is offered from righteous people that avail much. I don't want one person to leave here and think that you can be outside of God's grace and that power is available to you. It is very clear that the prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now understand that there are two righteousness, righteousnesses, if that's a word, that we have to walk in. There is a positional righteousness and there is a practical righteousness. We stand by the grace of God in the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In fact, I talked about that last week. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Our righteousness, our attempts at being right with God are like a filthy rag to him. But God in His grace and mercy has stepped in and through Jesus Christ has given us the opportunity to be proclaimed righteous before the Father. And that is a positional righteousness that we do not earn, that we do not work for. That is a gift from God. And I am thankful for that positional righteousness in Jesus' name. But all throughout the Word of God, we are also told that we must obey His commandments that we are to walk righteously before the Lord. And that would be a practical righteousness. And both of these are in view here when he says that the prayer of a righteous man avails much. Those who are positionally right with God and those who are practically right with God day by day. And sometimes we get intimidated at the thought of living a righteous life because we are all too well aware of our faults. We're all too well aware of our failures, of our sin, of our stumbling, and we believe that every time we stumble or we struggle in life that we are no longer positionally right with God and nothing could be further from the truth. Just because we stumble does not mean that our position with the Father has changed because that is not of works. It is by the grace of Almighty God. That does not give us a license to live any way that we want to, but it is just an encouragement to our heart that we can repent and we can be in that right standing with Him again. I want to assure you here this morning that living a righteous life doesn't mean that we will never fail. What it does mean is that when we do, we deal with it righteously. I can, I can still remember the day that I read that and it was so liberating for me. To recognize, because if you have an amplified version all throughout Proverbs, it doesn't just say righteous, it says consistently righteous. And you're thinking, wait a minute, how could I ever walk consistently righteous? And we think that being consistently righteous means that we never fail. But no, being consistently righteous doesn't mean you won't fail. It just means that when you do, you deal with it righteously. That you deal with it the proper way. And boy, was that liberating to me. It just means that when I stumble, it means that when I fall, 
It means that when I trip, it means that when I sin, I immediately before God confess that rather than try to cover it up. And I go to others that my sin may have affected and involved and I confess it to them. And I do my best to make restitution as we talked about several weeks ago to God and to man. It means that I turn my back on my sin and I forsake it. It means that I get back up again, learning from that experience, determined that I will never return to it again and fulfill those words of my Savior, go and sin no more. It means that I learn from the experience and I grow for it and I move forward in Jesus' mighty name. I want you to know that righteous men and women fail. They sin. They struggle. But they deal with it the way that God wants them to. They deal with it righteously in Jesus' name. You see, that's why God rejected King Saul but accepted King David whose sins were much more grievous to God than King Saul's. King Saul always wanted to handle his sin his way, in his uh, manner, on his terms. And that's why God rejected him. But David for all the sin that he committed was still acceptable to God because he always dealt with his sin righteously. Listen to his prayer in Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression. My sin is always before me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Did you notice that David acknowledged his sin? He confessed it, did not try to hide it, and he asked God, to create within him a clean and new heart and renew a generous spirit within him in Jesus' name. He dealt with his sin righteously and that's why God heard his prayer. And I know that this was what James was thinking because of the very illustration of a righteous man that he gave us here. Look at it, verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Powerful. God used Elijah mightily during a very desperate time in Israel's history. God actually used Elijah to bring judgment to the nation of Israel in order to get the nation's attention. And he did it by praying. And when he prayed, it didn't rain upon the land for three and a half years. And then three and a half years later, he comes back and he prays. And this time the heavens open, rain descends, and the fruit come forth. But the Bible says that Elijah was a man like Elijah. Us. He, he had a nature like us. And what that just simply means is that his nature was susceptible to sin just like ours is. There was nothing special about Elijah. He was a common man just like all of us. He had a nature just like ours. He could be tempted with sin. And we see that because if you know his story... Right after he saw the fire fall from heaven and consume the sacrifice. Right after he saw rain fall on the earth after three and a half years of drought. Even after he was actually empowered by the Holy Spirit to outrun a horse-drawn chariot back to the city. He immediately ran for his life at the threat of the king's wife named Jezebel. Hid in a cave, fell into a great depression and actually prayed for the Lord to take him. He fell. He gave up, just like many of us do. He wanted to quit. Just said, Lord, take me now. But God was with him. How many of you are thankful that God is still with you even in the darkest days of your life? Amen. God was with him, and he restored him, and he finished well because he would go back 
And he would raise up the next generation of prophets, starting with Elisha that we talked about at the very beginning. God was so pleased with Elijah at the end that he didn't even let him die. He took him into heaven in chariots of fire. How many of you are thankful? It isn't how you begin, it's how you finish. In Jesus' mighty name, bless the Lord. And he left that illustration just to tell us that being righteous doesn't mean we're perfect. It just means that when we fall, we get back up again. In Jesus' mighty name, I'm glad that he is a God of second chances. I'm glad that he's the God of third chances and fourth chances. How many of you are thankful that we serve a good and merciful God here today? My Bible tells me in Proverbs 24 and verse 16, for a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again. Bless God. You know, it's no secret that the church has really dropped the ball, not just Bethel, but the church in the United States of America, we've dropped the ball over the last 25 or 30 years. While the enemy was raging against this nation, most of us were entertaining ourselves, not serious about the things of God, and we've fallen. But I am so thankful that God is a God of second chances. And even now, we can rise up again in Jesus' name, and we need to. Because when the righteous pray, tremendous power, dynamic in its working, is made available to us in Jesus' name. I believe that God still has not given up on the United States of America because if he had, we wouldn't be here. I believe that God is still looking for a remnant that will get back up again and return to righteousness and then God will hear our prayers and move again in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody, give him all the praise. Bless God. Hallelujah. Come on, give him all the praise. Stand to your feet. Magnify his name here today. Hallelujah. We bless your name. Come on, lift your hands, lift your voices. Thank you for dynamic power that is available to us when we pray in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 God of mercy. God of grace, hallelujah. We magnify your name, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one is looking around here today. I'm just wondering how many of you here today, just by a show of hands, would say, you know what, Pastor Kurt, I am really going through that emotional and that mental anguish that you were talking about earlier. Just lift your hands right where you are. Amen. Many of you here today, you're just going through it. That's all right. That's what the body of Christ is all about. How many of you here would, would say that you need a physical healing here today? You need to know that God can heal you. Let me just see your hands. Many of you this one, I don't know, but I, I, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. How many of you just feel bound to some sin and you need to know that there's power to be set free from it? Let me just see your hands here today. There are some of you even there, praise God. Well, you're in the right place today because James speaks to us from 2,000 years ago to say that prayer makes tremendous power, dynamic in its working, available to us when we pray from a right place in Jesus' name. Father, you see every one of these hands and you see each one that raised their hands and that mental and emotional anguish and pain that they're going through. The hands that were raised for those who are going through some physical infirmity right now and those who feel bound in a, in a sin that so easily besets them but you brought him here to say that if you will pray, that if you will set your face to seek mine and you'll diligently go after me, that that prayer makes tremendous power, dynamic in its working available to you. I can set the captive free. I can heal the sick. 
And I can give you the strength to endure this mental and this emotional suffering that you're experiencing until the storm is over. I pray that all of us are beginning to understand what you have made available to us in prayer. And I pray that we would not grow weary in seeking your face because with you, all things are possible. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. Would you give God the praise in this house one more time? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell them we serve a mighty God. We serve a mighty God. Amen. Don't quit. Even if you're down, don't give up. A righteous man will get back up seven times in Jesus' name. I love you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week, God willing. God bless you. In Jesus' name.